Well, earlier in the year, uh, I took a series of studies on uh, early church history with the households at Cardiff. Uh, they weren't, um, it wasn't just a case of me preaching about church history, it was much more a, a dialogue session with each member of the household having allotted tasks concerning some the personalities of church history, some the theology, some the background. So it was a combined venture. But before we got into those classes, I gave an introductory talk that outlined something of the meaning of history. And it's that which I want to share with you this morning. Because I knew that there were some back home and I, I'm sure there will be some here that haven't really thought about the history of the church. And in fact, you probably haven't even thought about history since you left school. And because for you, history is always concerned with the past, then it has little relevancy for the now, particularly in what God is doing today. Well, I want to share some uh, outline thoughts, really, on the meaning of history. And I'm sharing it with two ends in view. One that some of you might get a little bit enthusiastic on the whole theme of church history, might start reading up something for yourselves. And the second reason is that I want to put what God is doing today into some kind of context. I've got four main headings to share that I want to develop. The first one is to see history as revelation. The second is to see history as the Word of God. Thirdly, to see history as progressive. And finally, to see history as response. The four headings then, history as revelation, Word of God, progressive, and response. There are at least two ways in which Christianity is unique amongst all the world's religions. And Christianity has its origins in Judaism, so what I say about Christianity is true of Judaism. But let's look at Israel first then. One of the new, unique things about Judaism is that its faith is based on historic events. And that is something that distinguishes Judaism and Christianity from all other world religions. The faith of the Jew is based on historic events so that three times in the year they will celebrate certain feasts. They will celebrate the feast of the Passover. And that's remembering how God brought them out of Egypt, delivered them from oppression. And then they will come up to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And there they're remembering that on Mount Sinai, God gave them the law. God covenanted himself into relationship with his people, and he gave them the law. And then they come up again to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And they're remembering there that God brought them safely through their wilderness journeyings, through all their sinfulness, through all their disobedience, and brought them finally to the land which he promised to them. And so three times at least every year, the devout Jew remembers his history. He brings those past events into the present. And in each celebration, each festival, he is reliving the fact that his God is a God of history and that his faith is based on that invasion of God into our world. They're looking back on God who is involved in the ongoing of history. They're looking back on God as a God who is involved with our time-space world. I'm trying to avoid that word now. But that's the basis of their faith. It's historical. Now, all the major religions have got their founders, their historic founders, Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius. But the history of their lives is not important. 
What is important in other religious faiths is the ideology, the philosophy that these founders have released into the world. We're not concerned about the birth and death of Buddha. We are concerned with the philosophies, the ideologies, and people are following those philosophies. Their lives are being governed by certain thought systems. But Christianity is unique. It is not concerned so much with philosophizing, with ideologies. It is concerned with historic facts. It is based on historic events. I preached Christ and Him crucified, said the Apostle. He wasn't preaching an ideology. He was preaching an event. Jesus was born. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again from the dead. And if there were no historic events, such as the birth, the death, and resurrection of Jesus, there would be no philosophy, there would be no theology, there would be no good news. We are not just dealing with ideas. We are dealing with ideas that stem from the event of Christ's resurrection. And that makes the whole process of history exciting. And that comes to the second unique feature of Christianity to other world religions. We're not just following a prophet or a wise man. We proclaim God manifest in the flesh. The staggering proclamation of Christianity is that the God of this universe actually was born in a stable. That he walked this earth that he spoke to people, that he healed their bodies, that he raised them from the dead, that he suffered a death on the cross, that he was buried in a tomb, that he rose again on the third day. That is the staggering proclamation of Christianity, that God invaded history in the person of Christ. He's clothed himself with historical parallels. He's clothed himself with flesh. He's clothed himself in our environment. He's clothed himself with our words, with our deeds, with our thoughts, with our aspirations. God hasn't just set history in motion and then let it go. God has created a universe and then fully identified himself with it by entering into history. And I think once we begin to grasp this, we begin to get a little bit excited about history. God has made it his own. I think sometimes when we look at history, we think, well, God's got, con uh, the devil has got control of it, that he seems to be running the scene. But God has invaded history to express his sovereignty and his control of this universe. And that means that history is not just a series of unrelated happenings. It means that God has taken control of it. It's not just a chaos of unrelated events. It is the expression of God. God has chosen to express himself in the sphere of history. So history has become a vehicle for the revelation of God himself. And that's the first point I want you to get hold of. History has been used as a revelation of God. I mean, God has revealed himself in nature. The psalmist sees something of the glory and the majesty of God in nature. God has revealed himself in conscience. And we know that God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ and in the word of God. But God has also revealed himself in historic events. He has shown what he's like. He has shown what he's after. He has shown his heart. He has shown his mind. Now, if we agree that history is revelation of God, what has he been saying? What is he saying in the process of history? My second point is to see history as word of God. Not just an event, but a word of God. As much a word of God as the voice of the prophet. As much a word of God as the scriptures. 
History is God's word. Let me express what I mean. Take the, the event of Christ. By the event of Christ, I'm embracing the whole thought of his birth, his life, his death, and his res resurrection. Take that event, that historic event. That event is the fulfillment of the prophetic word. The coming of Jesus was prophe prophesied in the Psalms and in the prophets. In the Old Testament, it is a prophetic word. And the prophets foretold of the Messiah who was to come. But in Jesus Christ, we see the Word made flesh, dwelling amongst us. That prophetic Word, anticipated in the Psalms and the prophets, becomes a Word made flesh in the person of Christ. And I want you to see Jesus as that living Word, embodying, expressing the written Word of God, the preceding Word of God that came through the lips of the prophets. Jesus expressed it in the flesh. It was the Word manifest in the event of Christ. Secondly, that event of Christ now becomes taken up in the proclamation of the early church. It becomes the good news. It becomes word again. What's word? The event of Jesus. His birth, his death, his resurrection. The word was prophesied. The word was made flesh. The word was then taken up again in the proclamation of the church. There is no distinction between the word and the event. The word is the event. The event is the word. We are spoken to by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in the Hebrew thought system... There is no distinction between word and deed. In fact, it's the same Hebrew word that stands for word and event. Uh, if some of you are taking notes, you can look at uh, Genesis chapter 15, just to give you a very clear illustration. Genesis 15 says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And you think, after these things? Well, what things? Well, it's all chapter 14. It's the story of the warfare between uh, Melchizedek, the story of, of uh, Abraham in that warfare, and Melchizedek, the prince of Salem. All these things. But that word, these things, is the Hebrew word for word. So literally it reads, after these words the word of the Lord came to... That, that is just giving you... You read that through yourself. That's just an aside. But the Hebrew word stands not only for the word, but for the event. Why? Because in each word of God, there is a seed. Each prophetic word of God has a seed, and that seed is the event. When God speaks a word, there is an event in that word. That is to say, when God speaks a word, something happens. The word contains the event. God said, let there be light. There was light. The word was the deed. God didn't say something and then do something. God said something and something happened. The seed of the event was in the word God spoke. No word that God speaks returns to him empty, but accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. Every word has got a seed. Every word has got a deed. Every word has got an event. And the psalmist and the prophets prophesied of the coming of Jesus Christ. Was that an empty word? It was a seed word. The deed was already done. As far as God was concerned, when he spoke the word, the event was a certainty. And in due course, that seed bore forth an event. It brought, brought forth Christ. But Christ is still speaking. How? By the Word. That Word is still becoming event in us. And I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just to see how Paul looks at the history of God's people. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul looks back at the greatest event in Israel's history, the Exodus. He speaks about baptism into Moses. He speaks how God supplied their needs in the wilderness. He talks about the idolatry of Israel. And then in verse 11, he says, These things happened to them as an example. And they were written 
for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Verse 6 says the same thing. These happened as examples for us. Now he's referring to an event generations previously and he's saying what happened to them has been written down for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And he re-preaches the event of the Exodus. And he applies it to the Corinthian situation. And he says there are some of you who are as guilty as they were. There are some of you who are, who are deep in immorality. And he wants to take this event and he says that happened and as, a, as an example. And we know what happened to them. And he's saying what is going to happen to us unless we take note. This word has come upon this generation. In other words, that accident, Exodus event has become a present word of God to the Corinthian church. I don't want you to look at history as a museum item. We are dealing with the invasion of God's word into history and God has not withdrawn his word. It is still functioning. I want you to see the word of God entering into historical events and still being around. The word that brought forth the Exodus has not been taken back. God is still the God of the Exodus. The promise of deliverance from Egypt is still effective. It was made effective in history in the resurrection of Jesus. It will be made effective yet again in your resurrection and mine. Do you see what God has spoken in that Exodus is a word that is still living in the church? Do you see the word that God spoke to that generation in the wilderness? It's a word that Paul says is as relevant to us today. Why? Because every word of God has got a bit of eternity about it. It's not rooted into time. It's rooted into eternity. It doesn't die with passing events. It's rooted into eternity. It doesn't die when the characters of history pass away. The word of God is rooted into eternity. Every word God has spoken into situations is not a dead word. It is a continuing word because God is still moving on the level of history. And I want you to grasp this thought that every word God has spoken is not going to go back void. It's going to work along the corridors of history until it finds its ultimate expression in the resurrection of the people of God. And our resurrection is not unlinked to the resurrection of Christ whose exodus was not unlinked to the exodus out of Egypt. These are all manifestations of God's word in history, all building up to that climax when he is going to present to himself sons in his own image. Turn to Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God spoke personally to Abraham in that local historical situation and he said to him that faith will be reckoned to you Abraham for righteousness God's word born out of a historic situation involving Abraham became Abraham's personal word but because it was God's word it's not limited because God has spoken in history even to Abraham it's not limited to Abraham that word partakes of eternity and will continue to run down history. So we come to the end of Romans chapter 4 and we read this. Verse 22. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Generations later, we step into Abraham's shoes. And in our own personal historical situation, we hear that same word coming into our hearts. It's reckoned to you, Graham Perrins, for righteousness. The word of God is alive. 
History is being repeated again as I stand in dependence before God and trust in His work in Christ. And it's that aspect of the Word of God reliving itself in our history all the time. History is an expression of God's Word. My personal history is an expression of the Word God spoke to me. Graham, it's reckoned to you for righteousness. I'm living in as much good as that as Abraham was. It's as real to me as it was to Abraham. And I hope it's as real to you. It's the historic word of God repeating itself in historic events. My life. Now I think in some ways we may be used to that concept. But believe me, God did not stop speaking with the resurrection of Jesus. God did not stop speaking when Israel changed to the church. What about the generations of historical experience of the people of God? Is there no word of God in it all? Surely history, the history of the church, is a greater expression of the word of God than this. Because it's living epistles that God is creating, living words that express His purpose in the level of history. If God could write another Bible, it would be better than this one. Because it would have the ultimate in it. This is all shadowy. And church history is dealing with the outcome of the resurrection of Jesus. And church history is dealing with the outcome of the resurrection of Jesus. And we just got a little glimpse of it there in the New Testament. Just a little foretaste. I don't want you to think the New Testament church made it. It never did make it. That's why there's a church history. Because they failed, there's a generation that's got to take it on. And there's a generation that's going to complete it and finalize the purpose of God. That's the end of church history. And it's not recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. It's not recorded in the scriptures there. But that end product is going to be realized on the level of time, on the level of history. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and I come to my third point. History is a revelation of God. History becomes a word of God. And one reason why we need to study church history is to see what God has been saying to his people in the generations that follow Jesus. But what about the progression of history? Some people say that history runs in cycles. I, I want to express the belief that history is progressive, that history is moving on to God's ultimate goal and purpose. And we have it in Ephesians 4. It's a passage familiar to you, but let me just read it again. All the gifts of the risen Lord, all the ministries he's put into the church are given in verse 12 for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It was the baby born in the Acts. We have yet to see the mature man. We have yet to see the church expressing the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But all the gifts and the ministries are geared to that finale, to that conclusion, when God can unveil his sons to a staggered universe. Now, here in Ephesians 4, the context is of a body. Verse 16, the whole body fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the working in measure of each individual part, causes the growth of the whole body. We are an expression here of the body of Christ. The gifts and the ministries are only going to be released as you give your bit, 
You give yours, I give mine. Mutually, we are building one another up into the maturity of Christ in this generation. But what I'd like to do is to, to view the history of the church transgenerationally. The church throughout the generations as the body of Christ. With each generation giving its own contribution to the building up of the historical Christ. Each generation playing its part in bringing the church to maturity. They, without us, should not be made perfect. They made their contribution and as they did that faithfully the next generation took the concept on and the church moves into the fullness of the stature of Christ. I'm looking for a finale and I believe it's not necessarily short term. That's why I appreciated what Jim shared with us. It could be very long term but I'm geared to that finale. I'm geared to that final generation that will produce the full measure of Christ on the earth. But I'll never get there alone. And we will never make it alone. Not only here locally will we never do it, but generation, history-wise, we've never done it on our own. There's not going to be one generation that will say, well, all these generations, they've all failed. We've made it. We only make it as an expression of the historic body of Christ. Sometimes as I look upon each generation, I think we've got dropouts. In my own time, I think the period between the Welsh Revival, the American Revival, the turn of the century, the whole Pentecostal movement, and then the beginning of this charismatic movement, there's a gap between. To me, it's a generation gap. There's a generation that made no positive contribution to the ongoing purposes of God between 20, 1930, 1940, 1950. We might explain it by the world wars. Explain it how you like, but there's something missing in that age. We look at the generation in the wilderness. Perish, the whole generation. A dropout generation. I think of 300 years of silence from the prophet Malachi, and I think, wow, what was happening? Why wasn't something happening? And yet I read of the coming of Jesus in the fullness of time. And that redeems the generation dropouts. Somehow, you know, God takes hold of the blanks in your own life, doesn't he? He takes hold of those years the locusts have eaten and somehow at the end of it all he's redeemed it. And so even in the history of mankind, in the history of the people of God, these dropout generations, these wilderness generations, somehow it's all building something into the people of God. I'm sure that Joshua and Caleb got something out of the death of their generation, which they passed on to the next generation. Somehow, through the remnant, we're building something constantly into the people of God that will put the steel of God into their beings. Yeah, I'm glad I've got this hope. We are progressing. Even if at times it doesn't look that way, we're progressing. We're moving on to the climax of God. Finally, history as response. I've majored on God's side, rightly so. History is God revealing himself. The events of history become God's word to us. And God is moving progressively towards that climax he has set, which will happen in the fullness of time. But history is also our response to what God is doing. I mean, the writer to the Hebrews makes much of this. He again goes back to the Exodus event, and he says the word preached to us was also preached to them. Same word. But it didn't profit them not being mixed with faith in those that heard. And so God is doing something. God is speaking his word. But history is dependent upon our response to that word. Today, if you hear his word, if you hear his voice, be not like those today. If you hear his voice, will we be the generation that will rise to the challenge of what God wants to do now? I get thrilled when I think of David, who served the purposes of God in his generation. That's a thrilling epitaph to have. 
serve the purposes of God in his generation. That's all that God asks us to do. Hear the word spoken to this generation. Today, if you hear his word, it's not the same as our fathers heard in the sense that it's now on the history. It's now on the level of history. It's now being built upon the past. There is something that God has put upon this generation that applies to no other generation. There is a calling. That's why sometimes I think we must major on themes. We must major on particular... I mean, sometimes you may get a little tired of the baptism in the Spirit or on the thought of covering or on the thought of dancing or on the thought of drama. But I believe there are things, there are words that are spoken to particular generations. They've got to get hold of it. They've got to make it part and parcel of normal church life. And that requires sometimes a majoring in a generation on concepts until they are part and parcel. Just like Luther majored on justification by faith. Now, sometimes the theology of that may not thrill you today. It's so much a part of the church, you don't get excited about it as they did. They died for that truth. And it's in that way the truth needs to be enshrined into the historicity of God's people. They must have this consciousness of what God has been saying down history. And it's made us what we are today. Now you might think, well, what does it matter whether I know about what happened in past generations? I think it's vitally important that we know what has happened in past generations. Let me uh, explain that on the personal level. I, of course, have a mother and a father. And it's vital that I come to some understanding of my father because I'm a lot like him. And in fact, sometimes it gets rather eerie because I can almost see my father in me. I can see in some situations that I react just as my father reacts. And you know, sometimes I don't want to react like my father reacts. And I've got to come to terms with something is passed on from one generation to another which affects how I instinctively behave. God visits the sins of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. There is something about this generation communication which is real. And I'd like to escape it sometimes. I don't want to behave like my father in certain situations. I had to come to terms with that. But God comes with love to thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments. And there's a sense in which the generation can be broken. The sins of the fathers can be broken from the here and now. I remember vividly praying one day, Lord, I don't want to respond in situations like that. And felt God cutting me off from the attitudes and the sins of the past. I am a product of my upbringing, of my environment, but I'm not a prisoner to it. And what is true in my individual level is true generation-wise. Why is it that Daniel... In Daniel chapter 9, praise for God to forgive the sins of the fathers because the situation in Babylon was a direct result of that. And it's Daniel who comes to terms with the sins of the past generation. Note that. Daniel accepts the responsibilities for the sins of the past generation and confesses them before God. And out of that confession and out of that repentance, because he identifies himself with the past generation, out of that repentance comes forth a deliverance of God, a moving towards his temple. The same thing you see in the book of Nehemiah. If you're taking notes, Daniel 9, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6. Same thing with Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 29, 1 to 11. All these men prayed that God would forgive the sins of the fathers. And as a result of identifying with that past generation's mistake, God delivered them from the same errors. Now, generationally speaking, you and I are products of our environment. I wonder, have you ever thought, why did Gerald Coates write under the, the subject of law and grace? because it reflects his upbringing. It, if, if it reflects this evangelical upbringing that we've, most of us have had. Not everything about this past generation's church life is worth holding on to. In fact, there are some definite truths that we need to repent of. 
there are some attitudes in the denominational churches we need deliverance from. Are we just perpetuating status quo? Or have we come with a fresh word of God to this generation? Are we trapped into the faults of church history? Or has God got a creative word that will bring deliverance to some generation so that they don't relive the mistakes of the past? If you don't know what's molded this age of the church, how can you pray and identify with the sins of the past? How can we be released from the errors of church history? It's no easy task. We've got to realize from where we have been born. We've got to realize something about the womb that's given us birth. There are two ways that you can view church history. I close with it. One way is, is the way that many people view it as a journey from point A to point B. So that supposing I'm on a journey from Cardiff to London, I'm in the train. I don't spend too much time thinking about Cardiff because I'm moving away from Cardiff and we just passed Newport. Now we're going to Bristol. Now Bristol is a nice place, but you know, I'm not really interested in Bristol because I'm headed for, for Paddington. And I think, well, what's ahead of us? There's Reading. Mm-hmm. Well, no, no, no. And I get on to Reading, and I think about Cardiff and Bristol. I think, yeah, we're well, very interesting, but we've passed all that. We're now on the way. Let, let me have the maps of London. Let me know all about...